complex numbers, or numbers involving, uh, conceptually you can think about it as the square root of negative 1, i, are essential to understanding quantum mechanics, since some of the most fundamental concepts in quantum mechanics, for instance the wave function, are expressed in terms of complex numbers. Complex analysis is also one of the most beautiful subjects in all of mathematics, but unfortunately in this course I don't have the time to go into the details. <laughs> Lucky you, perhaps. Here's what I think you absolutely need to know to understand quantum mechanics from the perspective of complex analysis. First of all, there's the basic definition. i squared is equal to negative 1 which you can think of also as i equals the square root of negative 1. A, in general, a complex number, z, then, can be written as a, the sum of a purely real part, x, and a purely imaginary part, i times y. Note, in this expression, z is complex, x and y are real, where i times y is purely imaginary. The terms purely real or purely imaginary in the context of an expression like this, x plus i, y, something is purely real if y is zero, something is purely imaginary if x is zero. As far as some notation for extracting the real and imaginary parts, typically mathematicians will use this funny calligraphic font to indicate the real part of x plus i, y, or the imaginary part of x plus i, y, and that just pulls out x and y. Note that both of these are real numbers. When you pull out the imaginary part, you get x and y. You don't get i, y, for instance. Another one of the most beautiful results in mathematics is e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. This formula kind of astonished me when I first encountered it, but it is a logical extension of this more general formula that e raised to a purely imaginary power i y is equal to the cosine of y plus i times the sine of y. This can be shown in a variety of ways, in particular involving the Taylor series. If you know the Taylor series for the exponential, the Taylor series for cosine of y, and the Taylor series for sine of y, you can show quite readily that the Taylor series for complex exponential is the Taylor series of cosine plus the Taylor series of sine. And while that might not necessarily constitute a rigorous proof, it's really quite fun if you get the chance to go through it. At any rate, the trigonometric functions here, cosine and sine, should uh, be, should be suggestive, and there is a geometric interpretation of complex numbers that we'll come back to in a minute. But for now, know that while we have rectangular forms like this, x plus i y, where x and y, the nomenclature there, is chosen on purpose, you can also express this in terms of r e to the i theta, where you have now a radius and an angle. The angle here by the way, is going to be the <coughs> arctangent of y over x. And we'll see why that is in, uh, in a moment when we talk about the geometric interpretation. But given these rectangular and polar forms of complex numbers, what do the basic operations look like? How do we manipulate these things? Well, addition and subtraction in rectangular form is straightforward. If we have two complex numbers, a plus ib plus and we want to add to that a second complex number, c plus id, we just add the real parts, a and c, and we add the imaginary parts, b and d. This is just like adding in any other sort of algebraic expression. Multiplication is a little bit more complicated. You have to distribute, and you distribute in the usual sort of draw a smiley face kind of way. a times c and b times d are going to end up together in the real part. And the reason for that is, well, a times c, a and c both being real numbers, a times c will be real. Whereas ib times id, both being purely complex numbers, you'll end up with b times d times i squared, and i squared is minus 1. So you just end up with minus bd, which is what we see here. Uh, otherwise, the complex part is perhaps a little more easy to understand. You have i times b times c, and you have a times i times d both of which end up with plus signs in the complex part. Division, in this case, is like rationalizing the denominator, except instead of involving radicals, you have complex numbers. If I have some number a plus ib divided by c plus id, I can simplify this by both multiplying and dividing by c minus id. Note the sign change in the denominator here. c plus id is then 
prompting me to multiply by c minus id over c minus id. Now when you do the distribution there, for instance, let's just do it in the denominator, c plus <coughs> id times c minus id, my top eyebrows here of the smiley face, c squared minus, sorry, c squared times id, or c squared plus, now, id times minus id, which is, well, I'll just write it out, i times minus id, which is going to be d squared times i times minus i, so i squared times minus 1, and i squared is minus 1, so I have minus 1 times minus 1, which is just 1, so I can ignore that. I've just got d squared. So what I end up with in the denominator is just c squared plus d squared. What I end up with in the numerator, well, that's the same sort of multiplication thing that we just discussed. So the simplified form of this has no complex part in the denominator, which helps keep things a little simple and a little easier to interpret. Now in polar form, addition and subtraction, well, they're complicated. Under most circumstances, if you have two complex numbers given in polar form, it's easiest just to convert to rectangular form and add them together there. Multiplication and division, though, in polar form have very nice expressions. Q e to the i theta times r e to the i phi. Well, these are just all real numbers multiplying together, and then I can use the rules regarding multiplication of exponentials, meaning if I have two things like e to the i theta and e to the i phi, I can just add the exponents together. It's like taking x squared times x to the fourth and getting x to the sixth. But qr e to the i theta plus phi. So that was easy. We didn't have to do any distribution at all. The key fact here is that you add the angles together. In the case of division, it's also quite easy. You simply divide the radii, q over r, and instead of adding, you subtract the angles. So polar uh, complex numbers expressed in polar form are much easier to manipulate in, in, in multiplication and division, while complex numbers represented in rectangular form are much easier to manipulate for addition and subtraction. Taking the magnitude of a complex number, usually we'll write that as something like z, if z is a complex number, just using the same notation for uh, absolute value of a real number. Uh, usually is expressed in terms of the complex conjugate. Now the complex conjugate, notationally speaking, is usually written by whatever complex number you have, here in this case x plus iy, with a star after it. And what that signifies is you flip the sign on the complex part, on the imaginary part. x plus iy becomes x minus iy. The squared magnitude then, which is always going to be a real and positive number, this um, absolute value squared notation is what you get for multiplying a number by its complex conjugate. And that's what we saw earlier with c plus id. Say I take the complex conjugate of c plus id and multiply it by c plus id. Well, the complex conjugate of c plus id is c minus id times c plus id. And doing the distribution, like we did when we calculated the denominator, when we were simplifying uh, the division of complex numbers in rectangular form just gave us c squared plus d squared. Um, this should be suggestive if you have something like x plus i y, that's really messy, x plus i y, and I want to know the squared absolute magnitude, thinking about this as a position in Cartesian space should make this formula, c squared plus d squared in this case, just make uh, make a little more sense. You can also, of course, write that in terms of real and imaginary parts. But let's do an example. If w is 3 plus 4i and z is minus 1 plus 2i, first of all, let's find w plus z. Well, w plus z is 3 plus 4i plus minus 1 plus 2i. That's straightforward. If you can keep track of your terms, 3 minus 1 is going to be our real part, so that's 2. And 4i plus 2i, which is plus 6i, is going to be our complex part. Sorry, our imaginary part. <clears throat> now, w times z. 3 plus 4i times minus 1 plus 2i. For this, we have to distribute. 
like usual. So from our top eyebrow terms here, we've got 3 times minus 1, which is minus 3, and 4i times 2i, both positive. So I have 4 times 2, which is 8, and i times i, which is minus 1, minus 8. Then for my imaginary part, uh, the I guess the mouth and the chin, if you want to think about it that way, I have 4i times minus 1, minus 4 with the i out front, will just be minus 4 inside the parentheses here, and 3 times 2i is going to give me 6i plus 6 inside. And the end result you get here is 8, or minus 8 minus 3 is minus 11, and minus 4 plus 6 is going to be 2. So I get minus 11 plus 2i for my multiplication here. I guess if I'm going to circle that answer, I should circle this answer as well. Now, slightly more complicatedly, w over z. w is 3 plus 4i, and z is minus 1 plus 2i. And you know when you want to simplify an expression like this, you multiply by the complex conjugate of the denominator divided by the complex conjugate of the denominator. So minus 1 minus 2i divided by minus 1 minus 2i. And if we continue <coughs> the same sort of distribution, I'll do the numerator first. Same sort of multiplication we just did here, only the signs will be flipped a little bit. We'll end up with minus 3 plus 8 instead of minus 3 minus 8. And for the complex, sorry, for the imaginary part, we'll end up with minus 4 minus 6 instead of minus 4 plus 6. And you can work out the details of that distribution on your own if you want. The denominator is not terribly complicated, since we know we're taking the absolute magnitude of a complex number by multiplying a complex number by its complex conjugate. We can just write this out as the square of the real part, 1, plus the square of the imaginary part, minus 2, which squared is 4. So if I continue this final step, this is going to be 5, uh, and this is going to be minus 10i, and our denominator here is just going to be 5. So in the end, what I'll end up with is going to be 1 minus 2i. So it actually ended up being pretty simple in this case. Now for the absolute magnitude of w, 3 plus 4i, you can think of this as w times w star square root. You can think of this as the square root of the real part of w plus the imaginary part of w. Sorry, square root of the squared of the real, real part plus the square of the imaginary part. Which is perhaps a little easier to work with in this case, so you don't have to distribute out um, complex numbers in that in that way. Real part is 3, imaginary part is 4, so we end up with the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is 5. Now this was all in rectangular form. <coughs> Let me move this stuff out of the way a little bit, and let's do it again, at least a subset of it, in polar form. In polar form, w, 3 plus 4i, we know the magnitude of w, that's 5. So that's going to be our radius, 5. And our e to the i theta, where theta is, like I said, the arctan of, in this case, well, not 4 fourths, 4 thirds. So that's the polar form of the complex number w. Now if you plug this into your calculator to figure out what the arctan of 4 thirds is, you'll get 5 e to the i 0 0.927. If you do the same thing for z, you'll end up with the square root of 5 times e to the i 2.03. And for instance, if I wanted to calculate w over z, I would just have, well, the radius associated with w divided by the radius associated with z times e to the i difference of the angles 
And if you take 0 0.927 and subtract 2.03, you end up with minus 1.1, give or take. And if you actually go through and check, you will find out that these two numbers are equal to each other. So that's an example of manipulating complex numbers, just in a very simple way. In order to check your understanding, here's another example for you to work through on your own. Now, the geometric interpretation I've been alluding to is, whoops, I wanted to do this in black, is in two dimensions, hopefully not too surprising. I kept mentioning the rectangular form and the polar form. Well, instead of the rectangular form being rectangular coordinates x and y, we're going to talk about the rectangular form being the real, the real and imaginary parts of a complex number. So if we have some complex number here, let's call it z, we can think of that as being composed of some real part of z and some imaginary part of z. That's the rectangular form of a complex number z. If you want to think about the polar form of z, well, this would be the radius associated with that, and this would be the angle associated with that z. So if I want to say z equals r e to the i theta, this is the distance I'm talking about for r, and this is the angle I'm talking about for theta. Now in the geometric interpretation, addition and multiplication do pretty much what you would expect. Or sorry, addition and subtraction do pretty much what you would expect. If I have a complex number here, say w, and another complex number here, say z, I can treat these as vectors and just add them tip to tail. So one vector is going in this direction, one vector is going in this direction. The vector sum will just put me out here, w plus z. Same thing for subtraction, but with the sign flip on whatever is being subtracted. This is for addition. If you want to multiply, the multiplication rule, or the uh, geometric interpretation, also has a nice way of treating multiplication. If I have some complex number, again, say w, some complex number, say z, the best way of thinking about this is in polar form, where I have, say, a vector with one angle here, I'll call that theta, let's call it theta1, and another vector here, with an angle theta 2. Theta 2. Sorry for the small font. I hope this is legible. When you multiply these two complex numbers together, you know you have to multiply the radii. Maybe that will put you out, you know, somewhere at large radii. And you have to add the angles together. In this case, theta 1 is going upwards, and theta 2 is going downwards. So if I go up theta 1, and then add, going back down, theta 2, I'll end up somewhere out here, say, where the distance I've gone is the magnitude of w times the magnitude of z, and the angle I'm at now here is theta 1 plus theta 2, where theta 2 is negative. So addition and multiplication have nice geometric interpretations as well. Um, especially useful in visualizing multiplication is this notion of rotating your complex vector. I have effectively rotated down theta 2 from the vector to w in order to get in the direction from the origin towards the product w times z. So hopefully that's reasonably clear. Uh, the geometric interpretation can help a lot when it comes to visualizing what actually happens with, um, well, with complex numbers, especially in the context of quantum mechanics when you're dealing with complex functions.
At any rate, <clears throat> here's another example where I'm going to draw out what these things actually look like. So I have two complex numbers, 3 plus 4i and minus 1 plus 2i. Let me draw myself a nice big coordinate system here. And I'll put some tick marks on it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. <coughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, more or less. Now, first of all, draw w, z, and w plus z. So w is 3 plus 4i. So my real part is 3, 1, 2, 3. My imaginary part is 4, so I go 1, 2, 3, 4. So I am up here. That's where w would be. Now, z is minus 1 plus 2i. So minus 1 plus 2i is z. So z is going to be there. Now if I treat these both as vectors, I have a vector to w and I have a vector to z. And I add the vectors the way I would normally add vectors, tip to tail. I'll end up here at w plus z. Now it's easy to see this in Cartesian coordinates as well. Um, if I'm adding w and z, I'm going to end up with 3 minus 1 for the real part, or 2 up here, and 4i plus 2i, or 6i, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, for the imaginary part. Now, w times z. If you actually go through and work out what w times z is, you'll find out it has quite a large magnitude. It has a magnitude uh, a little bit larger than 11, 11 point something. But what I really want to emphasize here is the geometric interpretation. And in that case, you need to know the angles involved. So I have an angle here, theta 1, and I have an angle here, theta 2. And it turns out, if I add these two angles together, say, going up theta 1 and then going over theta 2, I end up somewhere along this, in this direction. And you actually have to go out quite a ways. You have to go all the way to minus 11 plus, what was it, plus 2i, I think. Yes, minus 11 plus 2i is the answer for w times z. And if you just look at the angles here, adding theta 1 and theta 2 is going to point you in that direction. So you know it's going to have a negative real part and a positive imaginary part, but perhaps a small positive imaginary part, just by eyeballing the angles, which is not really all that bad. w divided by z it is the same sort of situation, except now instead of adding theta 2 to theta 1, you're going to subtract theta 2 from theta 1. So I'm going to go up theta 1 and then back down theta 2. And where you end up is actually here at 1 minus 2i. But just by eyeballing the angles, you can get a good feel for what part of the complex plane you're in, where typically Oh, come on. This is the real axis of the complex plane, and this is the imaginary axis of the complex plane. In Cartesian coordinates, you have two degrees of freedom, x and y. In the complex plane, you have two degrees of freedom, the real part and the imaginary part. The last thing that I need you to understand about complex numbers from the perspective of quantum mechanics is complex functions. Now, the theory of complex functions is a lot of fun, but beyond the scope of a quantum course. To give you an idea for how complex these things can be, f of z is a complex function. Now, z as a complex number, sorry, f of z, if f is a complex function, is going to be complex, meaning I can think about this as some real part function plus some imaginary part function times i. So my one function of a complex variable can actually be, complex function of a complex variable can actually be thought of as two separate functions. Separate real functions, mind you, so this is a slightly simpler way of thinking about things. But you have a real part and an imaginary part. Now in the case of true complex functions like f of z, z itself has two degrees of freedom. So you can think of this as f real, 
of the real part of z and then the imaginary part of z as two separate arguments to that function and then plus i times f imaginary times the same thing the real part of z and the imaginary part of z so we have instead of one function of one variable we have two functions of two variables and that makes things very difficult to visualize thankfully in quantum mechanics what we're typically working with is the wave function psi and psi for a lot of the problems that we're going to be thinking about is only a function of one coordinate so you can think about this as psi of x where x is a coordinate so psi well psi of x is complex x is real so while we have to think about the real and imaginary parts of psi we don't have to worry about the real and imaginary parts of x we can just think about this as x a single argument in terms of how to visualize complex functions like this you can think about plotting both the real and imaginary parts of this function as a function of whatever well, whatever you're working with. In this case, let's say we have to deal with psi of x. So this is going to be the x-axis, and we'll have something maybe it looks like this for the real part of psi of x, and something maybe it looks like this for the imaginary part of psi. So think about plotting two separate functions, the real and imaginary parts of this effectively single function as a function of, in the case of this, x, it's uh, rather simple to, uh, to visualize. Now I have some more advanced visualizations that use color to represent the angle in the polar interpretation of psi as a complex function, and they get a little bit psychedelic and you start hallucinating after a while if you look at them too much. But for now, try to keep in mind that complex numbers have real and imaginary parts and can be interpreted both as x and y in the complex plane, the real part and the imaginary part in a two-dimensional Cartesian plane, or a radius and an angle in a polar representation of the same two-dimensional complex plane. That's about it for quantum mechanics. Like I said, quantum, or sorry, that's about it for complex analysis as needed for quantum mechanics. Like I said, Complex analysis is a very deep, very beautiful topic, and I encourage you to study it further in the future. But for now, I think that's all you need to know.